Excellent. So this is our virtual ID table for October 4th, 2022. And it's very virtual again, because we're using iNaturalist. So it's double virtual. <clears throat> and we have two projects that we are looking at on iNat today. So the first project is our Sequinota project, which is uh, basically a project where um, I created it by including the locations of every foray that occurred at Sequinota and also <clears throat> the camp itself. And so when you're creating a project, you can add, you know, multiple locations and you end up with a kind of patchwork of a map. Um, so I sucked up every observation that happened in those places. So people did, could join the project, but you didn't have to, to be included in it. Um, but if you want to find the project, what you do is go onto iNaturalist and you can just type in Sequinota. Um, as you see here, our foray from last year will pop up and then our foray from this year, MAW Sequinota 2022. Now, if you click on the about, you'll get to sort of the front page. Whereas if you clicked on view observations, you would just kind of get a list of observations to start with. So I like to start with the about tab so you can see information about the project and some of this some of the stats about the project. So this is what that looks like. <clears throat> and, you know, already um, you can see we had a ton of observations. So really, you know, awesome. And so it's always great to see, you know, 954 observations, it's tremendous, 294 species. Now, I, we haven't gone through this with kind of a fine tooth comb to make sure that everything is, you know, like exactly correctly identified. I've tried to go through as much as I can, but if there's a discrepancy between, um, you know, our species list and this list, you know, I would probably go with our species with our species list because a lot of folks put a lot of time into identifying um, what was on the table. Um, but it's also possible things may have been put in the project that didn't make it to the table. So, um, you know, we can always see if there's anything that doesn't overlap once we have that. But the thing that I love most about this, you know, honestly, is not just the, you know, enormous number of observations and species, but that we had 38 people posting their observations, which is just terrific. Um, so, you know, it, I don't know how many people were there, but it's a big chunk, uh, for sure. It's like a big chunk of people who were there. Um, and so, <clears throat> yeah, that, that was me celebrating. Um, and then you, if you scroll down on the page, you can see some of these stats. So really the yeoman's work of our INAT project goes to Isabella Farr, who just did an amazing job as always, um, you know, of documenting what she saw and really good quality documentation. And just, um, I know she, you know, pounded the pavement or not the pavement, but the, the trails um, until the very last minute, you know, going out on even the last day in the rain. So true dedication um, and really capturing a lot of wonderful observations. So go is, um, but, you know, in general, uh, you can see lots of people contributed um, many observations and it's kind of interesting <clears throat> to look at the most observed species. You know, if you look at our project, uh, our, you know, MAW project on INAT, I think that the most observed species is probably fairly reflective of what we see out in town. Um, you know, turkey tail is on there and, you know, some other really common species. Here, the most observed species is this Entoloma quadratum, which is not a common mushroom at all. Um, but it's a special mushroom. And I think that's why it was most observed probably is because it's a real stunner. And I think people were really excited to find it. So I think pretty much anyone who saw it posted it. Um, and I'll be showing you more about it with some, some observations of it. Um, I think we anyone who was there can agree though that the second most observed here, the Cortinarius iotes, that was really coming up. I mean, you could not, um, you know, dance with a cat without running in, <laughs> running into a Cortinarius iotes. Um, so that seems pretty accurate. And, and, you know, chicken of the woods, I'm not sure the woods were overflowing with it, but we ate a lot of it. So <laughs> we did pretty good. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much that. So we'll start with these two really beauties. Um, and 
you know, I'll tell you these are two uh, Quartinarius species. And, you know, how do you know that these are Quartinarius? Um, well, there are sort of a couple distinguishing features for this genus, although the genus was recently divided into like seven other genuses, but we're going to pretend that that didn't happen because <laughs> that's just like TMI. Um, and we'll just call them all Quartinarius. Um, actually, I think both of these did remain in the genus Quartinarius, thank goodness. Uh, but anyway, so they have Cortina or Cortina, however you want to say it, which um, is Latin for veil. And, you know, so instead of having like a kind of more substantial veil the way like some of the Amanita species might have, where it's like, you know, um, clearly uh, <clears throat> kind of white and covers everything and you really can't see. This is actually like a cobwebby type of veil and, you know, it kind of stretches out and um, almost you can even see like the individual little fibers of it, which is cool. Um, so both of these uh, mushrooms have that and, you know, it's pretty much uh, identifying feature for Cortinarius. The other thing is the color of the spores, which I can show you in the next picture, but does anybody feel like writing in the chat so I'm going to tell you one of these is Quartinarius iotes and one of them is not. So anyone want to guess which one is Quartinarius iotes? You don't have to, but if you want to, you can write left or right, you know. Or you could just say it if you feel like turning on your. Okay. Okay, we got some a couple lefts, one left. right, but a lot of lefts. I'm hearing a lot of lefts. That's correct. So. The left is indeed Cortinarius iotes, and the right is Cortinarius violaceus, um, which is also absolutely gorgeous. Um, and you know they look quite a bit alike in the sense that they're both purple, and they both have this kind of web-like cort cortina or cortina. Um, they both have kind of bulbous base, and the, the size of them is pretty similar. So, what are the distinguishing features here? Um, Cortinarius iotes. Is has a really viscid cap that was in the common name, so you know you can tell it's an important defining feature. And in fact, <clears throat> people will say that the way you can differentiate iodes and iodides, which is another Quaternarius species that supposedly looks very similar, is by like licking the viscid cap um, and noting whether it tastes bad or not. Um, I'm probably going to flip this around, but I think iodes is like not supposed to taste bad and iodides is, but I could be, could be the other way. Um, to be honest, I don't think that we, I, it's not clear to me, like, I don't know that there's DNA evidence to really tell us which one we have, but I'm cool with just saying quaternary iodes. Um, and, you know, you can identify that by the slimy um, kind of purple cap. On the other hand, quaternarius violaceus, um, hopefully you can see well enough in this slide um can you tell it's really fibrillose like it looks almost like fuzzy wuzzy can people kind of see that um and it's also kind of a darker color i would say you know it's more of a deep purple and that that is true and when it gets older it can get a little browner um so that's how you would tell those apart oh someone raised their hand do you want to um susan would you like to comment You're muted if you are trying. Oh, maybe. They were probably mentioning they saw the fibrillous cap like you mentioned. Oh, cool. Yeah, okay. I'm an idiot at Zoom, so I don't know. I'm like, any questions? Um, yeah, that's good. I'm glad that people are seeing that cap. So here's the first one. Terrific observation by Natalie Howe. Um, great job, Natalie, because she has pictures here of everything that you really need to identify this mushroom. So you know, you see the middle photo is the in situ kind of photo where you can tell that it's growing. We can kind of infer it's growing under hardwoods because there's a lot of leaf litter there. Um, we can see the shininess of the cap. So in drier conditions, it might not be actually viscid or wet, but caps that were viscid, they tend to look shiny. And the other thing that they tend to do is have stuff stuck to them. So even if they're not wet, they will have little pieces of leaf stuck to them. And that's a defining feature for a lot of mushrooms. So, you know, you definitely want to pay attention to that. Um, like I was recently looking at a key for hedgehog mushrooms. And one of the things in the key was has pieces of leaf stuck to it. So, you know, these little clues can be really important. Um, you can see here, <clears throat> excuse me, 
Um, the gills are looking light purple, particularly in the young one on the left. In the right, I think you can see that some rust um, is kind of emerging, some rusty color, and that's the color of the spores. And like I said, that's another defining characteristic of Cortinarius. Um, one tell for Cortinarius is the remnants of the Cortina or Cortina. Um, they're often like kind of on the stipe. So can you guys see my pointer thing here? Yep. Okay, cool. So I'm pointing right now to these little, they look like wispy little pieces. And those are parts of the Cort Cortina, Cortina, and they will often kind of collect spores actually. So that's a trick. If you ever want to measure spores and you have a, a younger mushroom, you don't feel like making the spore print, grab the spores off of the um, Cortina. Um, or the partial veil, because those are the mature spores that have dropped there. And if you're trying to figure out, is this a bluet or a Cortinarius, look for the look for the remnants of, of a Cortina. And if you see there's rust color on there, that's going to tell you um, that you have a Cortinarius and, and not a bluet, because uh, Lapista nuda, the bluet, it would have pale pink spores. So you would never see that kind of rust color um, deposits. Sometimes they'll spore on each other too. So if you have a group of them, some of them will have like a rusty part of them. And here's uh, Isabella's observation of Cortinarius violaceus. I don't really have much else to say about it, but it's another beautiful mushroom. So, th so these two, <clears throat> they, I think these are also kind of lookalikes. Um, now, these are, these are both Entoloma species, and they're both very pointy, which is cute. I think it's <laughs> like extremely adorable. Um, and they both have cool colors. Um, and they're both sort of on the you know yellow orange spectrum, um, but these are two these are two different uh, species, and one of them is the one that we um, you know very commonly saw on this um, on this trip to Sequinota. The other one we only saw I think only like one or two people saw it. But um, does anyone want to guess which one is? Entoloma quadratum. I'll give you a hint. The, the, the common name is the salmon uh, pink gill. Pink gill is because all entolomas are called pink gills because their spores are pink. And so usually with time, the gills will kind of turn pink. Although truth be told, neither of these look like they have pink gills because the gills are kind of orange and yellow. I'm um, just going to look at the chat. Let's see. Left. Yes, that's correct. Correct. Someone said nose pickers. What does that mean? <laughs> oh, it's a direct message. My friend said, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's funny. Oh, they do look like nose pickers. Um, anyway, so um, the left is Entoloma quadratum and the right is Entoloma uh, unicolor, uh, which is really really beautiful. Um, so yeah, here's Entoloma quadratum. You can see um, it's really the color I think is the best way to distinguish them. Um, maybe also the habitat though, because this tends to grow in like boggy areas. Um, and I think it grows mostly um, with conifers. Like I've never seen it growing in an all oak kind of forest. Um, it definitely grows in the cedar swamps, Atlantic white cedar swamps of the Pine Barrens kind of coast. Um, but I also saw it growing when I was in North Carolina. Um, and there are a lot of pines around too. And it definitely grows in mossy wet areas. Um, and then this one, oh, sorry, Entoloma murrii. I don't know why I said unicolor, that's a different Entoloma. I got confused because this is a unicorn, yellow unicorn Entoloma. Uh, murrii, I guess that's the person who named it. Um, but yeah, I guess it looks like a unicorn because it has a really pointy cap. So, I mean, they both have pointy caps, but I mean, you can tell that Entoloma murrii has like a super pointy cap. Um, but otherwise, like their shape is not, not so, so different. Um, anyway, so those are two really cool ones. Now I'm going to go into a couple of rare mushrooms that were found at Sequinota, which, you know, actually there were a lot of rare mushrooms <laughs> found at Sequinota. Um, and that's awesome. I, I had to pick a couple, but I could have done a whole presentation of just the rare mushrooms of Sequinota. We found some weird, cool stuff. The first one, this is an observation by Jacob Kielschman. Um, who was one of our uh, awesome identifiers and mycologists who came and did just an incredible job of um, banging out identifications at the table, but also finding and taking tremendously beautiful photographs of mushrooms. <coughs> so I, I, also, I, I was excited to see him 
I, I got to see how he does his photographs um, <laughs> and uh, see him in action. And it, it was cool, like the lighting and he has, he brings his own lights and anyway, really neat stuff to make a picture this beautiful. It doesn't, it doesn't just happen magically. It takes a lot of work. Um, so this is Pluteus hispidulus and um, you can kind of see why it might be called hispid because it has this like fuzzy kind of hairy cap. Um, and I thought like the stipe really looks like it's almost translucent. It's like a tiny, strange looking pluteus. I mean, the gills almost look pleated, but fuzzy. And then it has, you know, this kind of dotting, like dark, dark coloring um, at the center of the cap. I mean, like if you, if you close your eyes or really squinted, you'd say like, that looks almost like a lepiota like, or something, but it, but it has, you know, free gills, um, like a pluteus, but I wouldn't, I would not have known what it was if I had seen it. And, um, yeah, I would, I probably would have, I don't even know if what I would have thought this was, because, you know, from the underside, I might think it was like, oh, maybe it's like a mycena, but then the gills are free, so no, and from the top, I, I mean, it's just a strange mushroom, and there are only 17 observations of this on iNaturalist, so it's quite rare, and the other thing is, um, as you can see, they're really scattered kind of all across um, the world. And it's really unlikely to me, although possible, but not super likely that these are all the same species, right? Because like the chance that this is exactly the same species in, you know, Southeast Asia, Europe, and then the Eastern and Southwestern United States seems low. So my guess is that there are probably even multiple, maybe cryptic species in here um sorry my kid is being blown up um there are multiple cryptic species in here i would guess and so maybe there are even fewer observations this was another really cool one <clears throat> it looks like an earth fan and um i think i think we may have misidentified it at first but then got the um identification of cotylidia panosa and uh this is again like a very rare uh very rare mushroom, um, as you can see, you know, again, it's funny, there are 17 observations of it. Um, and only, um, only a few of those are in the Northeast, some of them are in Europe. So I'm not sure if that means that it's the same species or not. This one, I was really excited. Um, I found some of this, um, Tom Bigelow found this too, but other, other people found it as well. I was so excited, like when I saw it, I, I thought, what the heck is that? Um, because, you know, you can tell that you're looking at, you think you're looking at like an earth tongue, like a, um, a trichoglossum species, or, you know, maybe you might think geoglossum species, you can't really tell, but then it has this kind of white stuff on it, um, looking like it's infected with kind of another, um, a mold. And I didn't know that there was a mold that grew on um, earth tongues, but Tom, Tom Bigelow knew, um, or maybe it was Ethan Crenson, I'm not sure, but one of our awesome mycologists knew immediately what it was. And then later I Googled it um, just to see if I would have been able to find it. And I just Googled earth tongue and mold or hypomyces. Cause if there's a mold growing on something, it's a good guess that it might be hypomyces. And I did, I was able to find it on my own, but um, the name is really a, a mouthful and I would never be able to keep that in my head. So I was so impressed that they were able to do that. Um, anyway, so that was a fun find. I, I think, you know, uh, fungi parasitizing other fungi is always a crowd pleaser for the crowd of one of me. Uh, so <laughs> anyway, um, oops, I skipped one. This was cool. So we, ate, everyone who was at Sequinota probably ate this uh, <laughs> because these were the black trumpets that we had and they are not the usual trumpets that we see in our neck of the woods, we're used to seeing Craterellus phallax, um, you know, which from the top you could probably confuse maybe, although um, still some, some differences, which I'll talk about. Um, but definitely if you looked at the underside, you would say this is not, this doesn't look like a normal black trumpet compared to what we're used to seeing in like the DC, Maryland, Virginia area. Because you can see these have real, Kind of veiny ridges, um, you know, if you want to call them gills or ridges or veins, whatever it is, it's pretty pretty pronounced um, and just really beautiful. And there's I, there's a kind of blue 
blue tint to the whole thing, black, kind of black and blue, very, like really gorgeous. And then the, um, the cap, like, you know, if you look at it from the top, the cap is kind of fibrillous. Um, whereas, you know, that's not the case with Craterellis phallax. It's really like the, the underside is smooth, the top side is smooth, and it's kind of dull in color. So I would say the colors here are richer, the textures both on the top and on the underside are richer. And I, I wouldn't have known um, what to call it, but Jacob had gotten the name of it recently uh, from Rachel Swenny, who um, <clears throat> I think also is in the Matheny lab in Tennessee and who has been studying um, a lot of the Cantherolales, like the Craterellus species, um, Hydnum, Hydnum species too. So uh, that's great. And she's on iNaturalist too. So if you post, you know, any of your Craterellus or Hydnum species, you might get a um, ID from her, which is kind of cool. Someone who's writing, writing the papers and writing the keys that we're using. So this is just a nice description if you want. And I thought I would just like show this website because I like, I use Myco Quebec a lot, mycoquebec.org. Um, I'm always happy to share like resources, free resources, because there are so many good books, but there are also really wonderful websites out there. Probably a lot of you know Mushroom Expert, which is uh, Michael Quo's website, which is like really incredible, like encyclopedic and amazing documentation of species, most of which are species he's found using his own pictures. Um, Michael Quebec is also really terrific. And a lot of the folks who are, are kind of creating and running this website are you know serious mycologists who are publishing species and um, you know just a plug that the folks behind Myco Quebec have published free online uh, book about trichelomas recently and another one about Portinarius and you know they literally you can download the PDF of it and you can get it printed yourself so I'm definitely going to be doing that um, because they have like a lot of it's definitely their Cortinarius and Tricholoma um, kind of species list is way more up to date. It's you know DNA informed in a way that most of the books that that I have at least probably are not. Okay, so this is my favorite <laughs> observation of the month. I decided to take from the Sequinota observations, um, <clears throat> and the winner of this observation of the month. You know what I what I thought they did so well was to capture everything that you would need for an ID in really clear, really close up photos. Um, I'll just go to it. Um, so that was Anil and uh, his, he goes by the Globetrotter, which is a snazzy name on INAT, that's his handle. I know that's what the kids call it, your handle. My handle is we are the champignon, he's the Globetrotter. So we're both very fancy worldly people. <laughs> Anyway, um, I just love this observation. Um, well, partially because I think it's a cool mushroom and I was excited that a bunch of people found it at Sequinota, but also because he did such a good job. So um, the pores, on um, this is a bully, um, or it's a, in the, yeah, it's a bully. Um, it's it used to be a, considered a Sewillus, but then it was moved to its own genus um, with informed by DNA. Um, and it has the reason probably that it was in the Swillis kind of group, or they used to call it like Fusco bol Bolitinus or whatever, that's what they used to call Swillis. Because if you look at the pores, they look stretched out. They're not perfectly round the way that a lot of bolites are. So it almost looks like the underside of a slippery jack or a Swillis, um, but it's not. And then, um, you know, the other pictures uh, that he included, they clearly show the cap, which is dry and, um, you know, the colors. And so this is um, both Bothia castanella. Um, so I think castanella just refers to the color. I think it's like a chestnut color, uh, I think. Um, and Bothia refers to Ernst, Ernst Both, who was like, he was a very famous and very excellent mycologist who, um, you know, if you have the, he's written a lot of books, you, pro you may have books that he wrote and, um, this mushroom grows under oak trees and it's just kind of fun. It's like has its own genus. It's so weird, you know, it's gets to have its own genus. Um, it's, I guess what you call that, like mono, monotypic, um, meaning it's the only one in its club. 
Um, I think that's the right word, but if it's not, sorry. Okay, so now uh, moving on to our general iNaturalist project, I'm just looking at the time, 7.42, so I'll try to speed it up a little bit. Um, so just looking at our general iNaturalist um, MAW project, again, the way that you find that is by going into the search bar and you start typing in mycological association. You don't have to get very far before um, our project comes up here, Mycological Association of Washington, DC. And I recommend that you click the about button instead of the view observations because the observation is just gonna take you to a list and you won't know really what you're looking at. But if you go to the about, you'll see this beautiful um, front page and it'll tell you kind of what the story is. You can look at who's in the club. You can join um, the project by clicking here. It says leave because I'm already a member, but it would say join if you weren't a member yet. Um, and you know, here you can see we have a ton of observations, which is pretty cool. Um, 17,672 observations, tons of species, and tons of people participating, which is great. Um, <clears throat> I looked at, to, to draw uh, for this presentation, I, I did, I think when I spoke with you guys about um, INAT, you know, earlier in the summer, I was telling you about filters and I used a filter for this. So the filter I used was date and I filtered from the day of the last meeting to the, to yesterday, um, because I just wanted to see, I wanted to show you what, what people are seeing in the last month. Um, so that's nice. You can look at like a discrete period. So th these are just the top of the list um, when you do that. So some of these uh, observations are from the foray that folks went to. Um, where uh, where was it again? It was at, uh, what do you call it? Um, Patuxent, Patuxent Refuge, Research Refuge, which is such a cool place. I think you guys, some of you guys went there a couple of weeks ago. Um, and so this is a cool, another nice one by Anil. Um, this is this is a Swillis. So um, that's in the Boletals. It's not a Bolete, it's not Boletaceae, but it's in the Boletals. So it's like a relative um, of a Bolete. It's a slippery jack, except this is not slippery jack, which is Suillus luteus. This is slippery Jill, which is kind of a funny name. Um, and what you can see looking here is that it has like a very sort of thick gooey looking veil. Um, and the cap is gonna be tacky and viscid and um, really, you know, very pretty. It's called Salmo Salmona color because it is salmon colored. And that's even more apparent if you slice through it, um, which I think there is a picture down here, um, but I, I should, maybe I should have showed it, but it's really salmon colored inside. I've heard people say this is a choice edible. Um, I don't like, I have, when I see Swillis, I'm like not wanting to eat them because they're just so like slimy, but I do know people who eat them. And I think the trick is if you want to eat them, you just have to remove that veil, like the cap. You just peel it off. Very easy to peel off the cuticle, very easy to get rid of the veil. Just be aware that some people do have a reaction to the stuff that makes up the veil. So some people actually have like an allergic kind of skin reaction. So just, you know, if you find that your hands are irritated after peeling a hundred slippery Jills or Jacks, maybe wear gloves the next time. <laughs> Um, here's another Suillus that Megan Romberg found, um, and this is Suillus americanus, um, and it's a chicken fat mushroom because it's the color of chicken fat. Um, and again, people, people totally eat this, but it, like I said, peel it. I've also heard people say Suillus are much better dehydrated. And I know a lot of people who will kind of peel the caps off, dehydrate them, and then pulverize them into a powder into and they almost can make like a fake porcini powder um because they can have a similar flavor so you know beautiful mushroom and you can tell um different in the sense that you know you can see here there are some veil remnants like there's a kind of appendiculate margin meaning little pieces of the veil are hanging from the top of the cap um and i think you can see little pieces of the veil stuck to the stipe but it's definitely not to that degree, right? It's a lot more subtle. Um, Swillis often have what you call glandular dots, um, which are these like little punk day. Um, and you can see them 
you know, here uh, they're kind of pink colored and this uh, slippery gel. And then here in Sulos Americanus, um, they can be a little red and then they can get very dark with age. They often will change colors. <clears throat> this is my observation. Um, just one more Suillus, Suillus weaverae. You may have heard of it as Suillus granulatus um, or granulatus, but that uh, turned out to be a European species. So this is like our American version of it, weaverae named for someone named Weaver, I'm sure. Um, and this one is, you know, similar to the other ones, it does also have glandular dots, but it doesn't have any partial veil. There are no veil remnants. If you look at the margin of the cap, it's perfectly smooth. It's not, there's no stuff hanging off of it, pendiculate kind of margin. And if you look at the stipe, it's also perfectly smooth. There are no little pieces of old veil attached to it. And you know, even if you found a tiny baby of this, you would not see any veil. So <clears throat> I, I actually am gonna breeze through this, but if anyone ever wants to like practice using a key, a dichotomous key. Um, you know, Michael Fo has some really good keys and I, I ended up putting together some pictures from his Swillis key and I was gonna go through it with you guys, but we just don't have time. Um, but I'm happy if anyone ever wants to like, I'm sure many of you use these all the time and are used to it, but if anyone hasn't used a dichotomous key, dichotomous because at every point there are two choices. Um, so it's always like, door number one or door number two. And then once you do that, then it's like, okay, do it again and do it again until you get to your species. Um, it's just a great way to learn, I think, even particularly when you know what something is. So I would recommend if you have already identified a mushroom, still take it through the key and you'll learn a lot about why it's different from the other mushrooms. And you'll learn a lot about what the lookalikes are. And that is how I learned bullets because otherwise they are just baffling. So I just took everything I ever found and put it through a key. This is a bullet lookalike that someone posted um, from Rockville. Uh, so yeah, if you saw this, you would see pores, you would see a stipe and it grows from the ground and you might think like, oh, what kind of bullet is that? It's a little funny looking. Um, but actually it's not a bullet. So it's polyporous radicatus or radicatus. Um, so it has a very thin pore layer that is like, it, it doesn't really come apart from the flesh of the cap. It's like basically, you know, attached to it. Bolites, it's very easy to separate the pore layer. Um, also, you know, the cap of this is sort of hard and bolites that often are fleshy and soft. Um, so, you know, and if you, if you excavated this, you could find a very long root a lot of the time. Um, but I often see people posting this in the bully group and it's kind of fun to say it's not a bully. Uh, so the, the last of, of these lookalikes, you've seen a lot of like things that want to be porcini, but are not. Um, but now we're getting to the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. So uh, someone did post uh, a porcini mushroom found in Rock Creek Regional Park, where we do a lot of our forays. Um, so good to know that, you know, in the third week of September, Porcini is popping in Rock Creek Regional Park. Keep that in mind. This is uh, Bolitis uh, variopes um, or Veripes. I don't know, it, you know, how you want to say that. But, um, you know, it, you can see all of the sort of defining features of a real Bolitis edulis group mushroom. So this is like a relative, a close relative of Bolitis edulis. You can see there's netting on the stipe. It's it's white. Um, if this were a nasty look like Tylopolis felius, it would be darker netting. Um, the pores are, you can't even see holes because in this young mushroom, the pores are what you would call stuffed. Um, it's, it's like a kind of partial veil, but instead of being like a piece of um, kind of fabric-y mycelium, instead it's like the mycelium is individually filling each pore. Um, but you know, you can imagine that that too would protect young spores that are trying to develop. And then as the mushroom matures, the stuffed pores kind of get unstuffed, they open up and then the spores you know, are mature and they come out of the tubes. Um, so this is just a really delicious, gorgeous mushroom. And definitely it is the gold at the end of the rainbow that we are all looking for. These are the droids that you want. Um, and then other things that you might enjoy eating at this time of year, there's a lot of honey mushrooms out there. Um, so 
we have Isabella's observation of Armillaria melia. Um, and, you know, this is one of the honey mushrooms that has a ring on it. So it's called often a ringed honey mushroom. And then we <clears throat> also have Desar malaria sespitosa, which used to be, gosh, it was called Desar malaria tabascans. So that's probably what it is in your book if it's a if it's not a brand new book. Um, sespitosa, I think, is a pretty good word because it means sespitose, and this always grows in a sespitose way, meaning it's like extremely crowded. So it looks like a bouquet of ringless honey mushrooms. These two um, kinds of honey mushrooms, all honey mushrooms, armillaria and desarmillaria should have white spores. So, you know, if you're when in doubt, do a spore print. Um, and they tend to grow in clumps. They grow from wood, sometimes from the buried wood in the ground. Um, you know, some people have some GI problems eating these. So definitely be very careful if you do decide to try to eat these, you know, make sure you know what it is. Um, and then, to eat only a little bit and cook it very well the first time to make sure you tolerate it okay. And you know, people say for this one, really cook it well because it's like very fibrous sometimes. But you know, a lot of people like it. Here's just our regular neighborhood craterellus, um, which you can see does not have those veins, and the top of it is not beautiful blue, black, and fibrillose. Um, and then just comparing it to the one that we were eating at Sequinoda. These are just a couple beautiful pictures. Jeff DC posted this stunning, I just think stunning photograph of um, Amanita fulva, <clears throat> which is a one of the Amanitas in section vaginate. Um, you know, you could say it's a grisette in the sense that's like kind of what you could the common name for that whole group. They don't have usually almost almost all of them don't have rings, but they have these beautiful cup-like vulva. Um, that you see here and the vulva has a limb that's kind of attaching to the stipe um, and it's just gorgeous. They have lines um, on the margins of the cap. That's another identifying feature. And this was Serenella's gorgeous photo of My Mycena leana, which I just also is such a beautiful mushroom and her photo I thought was so wonderful. Um, so I wanted to share that. And then the last thing I'll say is an announcement. I'm very excited <clears throat> to steal this idea from the Pittsburgh club. Uh, Tom McCoy and I had a great time uh, attending the link off foray a couple weekends ago um, with in Pittsburgh. And um, yeah, so they did a mushroom bingo previously. Kara Coulter, uh, one of their mycologists, put this together for them. And I thought it was so fun. I actually participated even though I didn't, uh, wasn't in the club. Um, but then I'm like, we have to do this. So we're gonna have our own bingo. Um, it's an iNaturalist project that I've already made and I have sheets that I'm gonna email out so you can you know, have a PDF uh, of the sheet um, to use. This is, how you find the project up here type in ma bingo maw bingo and you can see ma bingo fall 2022 comes up and you can go to the about and you will see this front page this is just a game for us um upload all your observations over the next month it'll start you know basically tomorrow um and it'll go until our next meeting um when we'll announce the winners um if so if you think you have a bingo you know what a bingo is right i mean i can include instructions in the email but it's like five in a row um it can be you know down or across or diagonal um there will be prizes um just like in real bingo you need to pay attention to your bingo card so i'm not going to tell you if you have a bingo you need to yell it and uh that could be actually just like messaging me <laughs> directly on iNaturalist. Um, if you just yell bingo in your house, probably nobody will hear you. But if you message me on iNaturalist, I will record it and give you the prize you deserve. So please join the project. Um, should be a lot of fun and the prizes will be good, I promise. Uh, this is what the bingo card looks like. These are, I know that these species will come up in October because these are all my observations. Um, these are my pictures that I have taken in the last two years since I started doing iNaturalist. Um, and they're all things that I have found um, in October in this area. So um, I'll send you guys a card and get started and, you know, good luck.